Um, okay, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, the scientific consensus on human caused global warming. And I thought that a good, a good starting point is this quote, which is one of my favorite quotes on the topic. This is by John Reisman. And he says that science is not a democracy, it's a dictatorship. And it's evidence that does a dictator. And what, what Reisman is saying is that our understanding of the world uh, is, is dictated by the full body of evidence. And, and that's really the strength of the scientific method, is that we, we come up with hypotheses that explain how the world works, and then we test it with evidence, and then we give it further testing by submitting it to peer review and, and getting it published in peer review journals, where then we see if our research can survive the test of time. So, so what is our understanding of human-caused global warming? Now, there's a professor in, in California at Berkeley, Mike Rennie, and he recently ran a study where he asked 270 random Americans to explain the mechanism that's causing global warming. And what he found was none of them were able to successfully explain the mechanism. And so I found this quite intriguing that, that not a single person could, could really understood what was causing global warming. And a couple of weeks ago, I was giving a lecture on campus here to second year environmental engineering students. So I asked the same question to the classroom. I said, can anyone in the room explain the mechanism that's causing global warming? And none of them were able to explain it. One guy came close, but not, weren't quite able to fully understand it. So I thought I might run this experiment another time and just test it in this room. Now, there should be a lot of UQ brain power in here, so, so and I think we're being filmed, so UQ is really on trial here. So, um, so uh, can anyone have a stab at explaining the mechanism that's causing uh, recent global warming? Anyway, yes? Uh, so, when the, the sun rays come down at, as short wave radiation, they hit the ground. Which and it is reflected back as long wave radiation, and when long wave radiation hits, uh, CO2 in the air is scattered in random directions, and as a result of that, part of it stays in the atmosphere. That's, that's pretty good, actually. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, okay, so. so just, I'll send you a website. So, <laughs> so sunlight warms the air, you know radiates this long wave radiation that gets absorbed or scattered by heat trapping greenhouse gases. But why don't the greenhouse gases absorb and scatter the sunlight that's coming through? Uh, you asking me or? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, because well you sound like a smart guy, you still have big words. So. Uh, I would just, I'm not a physicist, but so I just guess that it was coming in at a, as a, at a different frequency than when it bounces back. Okay. Yeah, uh, well, you got further than the environmental engineering students. So, yeah. So that, that's about the. Um, that's pretty good. Thank you. Now, yeah, you, you really did capture the dynamics, uh, the important elements of what's causing global warming. And sorry if this seems basic, but there is a reason why I'm doing this. Is that, that as you said, sunlight comes comes through our atmosphere and warms the earth. But the important thing is that that. Even though there's greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the, the, the carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are essentially invisible to sunlight. So the sunlight just passes straight through our atmosphere. The Earth warms and then re-radiates infrared heat back out in space, with greenhouse gases absorb infrared heat. And so, so that's really the dynamic of the greenhouse effect. Greenhouse gases let sunlight in, they trap heat as it's going back out to space. Now what we're doing is adding more greenhouse gases to the atmosphere whenever we burn fossil fuels. And the result of this is that these extra greenhouse gases are trapping more heat and less heat is escaping out to space. So this is our understanding of what's causing global warming. Now this is where the scientific method is so powerful because we can test our understanding of the science with the evidence. So if greenhouse gases were trapping more heat and stopping less heat from escaping out of space, then we should 
see, we should be able to measure less heat escaping out of space using satellites. And that's what's been happening. Over the last few decades, satellites have been orbiting the Earth, measuring infrared radiation as it comes up from the Earth's surface. And what they're measuring is less heat escaping the space at the exact wavelengths where greenhouse gases absorb radiation. Now, if there's less heat escaping out of space, then we should see more heat returning back to Earth. And again, surface measurements that are looking up and measuring infrared radiation coming back down in the atmosphere are measuring more heat returning to Earth, just as we would expect. Now, there are, other, there are a number of other human fingerprints that we expect to observe from greenhouse warming, specific patterns that are, that are unique to, <coughs> to global warming caused by greenhouse gases. One of them is we expect to see the upper atmosphere cooling at the same time that the lower atmosphere is warming. And in fact, a paper just came out this week by Ben Santa that uh, <coughs> examined satellite measurements of the, the thermal structure of the atmosphere, so basically the, the different trend, warming trends throughout the different heights of the atmosphere. And what he found was, was the exact pattern that you would expect from greenhouse warming, a cooling upper atmosphere while having a, a warming lower atmosphere. And there are actually a number of different human fingerprints that have been observed across our climate system that all point towards uh, in increased greenhouse effects driving global warming. So what this all adds up to is a consensus of evidence. And when you have all the evidence agreeing like this, the inevitable result is you get a consensus uh, among scientists. Now there's been several surveys or analyses um, uh, looking to measure the amount of agreement in, among, among the climate science community. Now one of them was um, by Peter Dorn in 2009, where they interviewed about, or they surveyed about 3,000 Earth scientists, asking them if they thought humans were significantly changing global temperature. And what we found was that, and this was across a range of different types of Earth scientists, but as the scientists' expertise in climate science grew, the level of agreement that humans were causing global warming also strengthened. So that by the time you got to climate scientists who were actively publishing climate research in the peer reviewed literature, you found a 97% agreement that humans were significantly changing global temperature. Now the next year, William Anderegg published a study where he basically took uh, public statements on climate change uh, given by uh, scientists. And then he assembled all the scientists who had issued statements uh, endorsing the consensus versus all the scientists who had issued statements rejecting the consensus. And he worked out how many, which of them had published peer-reviewed climate research. And he found again that among the climate scientists who had published climate, uh, peer-reviewed climate research, that there was a 97% consensus among, among that group. So the scientific, uh, the level of scientific agreement among the scientific community is robust. And it actually, it's so robust, it actually manifests in a number of different ways. For example, the scientific academies or the national science academies from 80 different countries have issued statements endorsing human-caused global warming. And zero, not a single national academy of science has rejected the consensus. That's not to say that the consensus is completely unanimous. There is one organisation that has issued a statement um, dissenting from the scientific consensus, and that's the American Association of Petroleum Geologists, which I think in this case indicates uh, that it's really the exception that proves the rule. So what's that? I understand they have come around. Um, well, I was looking this up today. I was just doing a bit of fact-checking, and they originally published a statement quite negative against against the consensus prior to 2007. <coughs> In 2007, they updated their statement. It's still quite equivocal, so they're not um, in, they're not endorsing a the consensus. They're saying, oh, a lot of our members are undecided, and it's, yeah, so they're still on the fence, I think, it would, it would be the best character, characterization of their position. So, and... I really should go back to 2004, which is really the seminal work on scientific consensus. And this was done by Naomi Oreskes, 
who sought to measure the level of agreement in the peer-reviewed literature for um, peer-reviewed papers about global climate change. And what she did was she looked at papers from 1993 to 2003, 928 papers, is it? Yeah. In total. And what she found was 75% of the papers endorsed the consensus. 25% of them didn't state a position on, on the consensus one way or the other because, they, they, for example, there would be research that was on a very specific narrow question like like um, measuring devices or um, just just kind of research that wasn't specifically about human caused global warming. But the striking result was she found zero papers rejecting the consensus. So over over 11 year period of global climate change papers, not a single one rejected human cause global warming. So the scientific consensus manifests in a number of different ways. Like we've seen that it, you know, we see the consensus of evidence, all the human fingerprints observed in climate change. We see it in the climate science community in several different surveys. Uh, in a number of organisations, and I think I've mentioned that it's not just the National Academies of Science, <coughs> There's um, scientific organisations like CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology here in Australia that also have issued statements endorsing the human caused global warming. And in the peer reviewed literature. Now, despite this robust consensus, there is a, a significant gap between public perception of consensus and the 97% reality. Now, earlier this year, I ran a survey with a representative sample of Americans where I asked them what percentage of climate scientists agree that humans are causing global warming. And the average answer was 55%. So there's a, there's a significant consensus gap between what the public think and the reality. Now, before you uh, think, well, the Americans might think that, but Australians, we're, we're we're a bit more accurate. I also ran the same survey with a representative sample of Australians, and the average answer was 58%, which is statistically indistinguishable from, from the Americans. <coughs> so we can't be too smart. Now, why is, it, why is there such a large consensus gap? Now, I'll suggest a large contributor to this is the fact that over the last two decades, there's been a persistent misinformation campaign to manufacture doubt about the scientific consensus. Now this goes back into the late 80s, um, where the OISM, which is the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine, um, uh, distributed a paper, um, a, a climate denial paper, but, but typesets would look like an official scientific document and distributed it to the whole scientific community to try and portray that impression that that there was ongoing scientific debate about the basic fact of human global warming. In 1991, Western Fuels Association spent half a million dollars, is that? Yeah, half a million dollars on a campaign to reposition fact as theory. And, and the way they did this was by using just a few dissenting scientists as spokespeople to, um, to portray that impression to the public that the scientific community as a whole was still debating um, global warming. Now, the, the really interesting one in here that I want to focus on is one in the middle of the Lance memo. Now, I'll just, I'll provide a quote. Now, this is a memo that Frank Lance issued to Republicans during uh, the American election. And he was basically advising Republican politicians on how to approach the um, the debate, the political debate about climate policy. And his advice was that they needed to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate. Now this is the debate about climate policy, it's not even a debate about science. But what he was saying was we need to put the focus on scientific consensus, cast out on the consensus. And if people think that the scientists disagree, then they're not going to support climate action. Now, this is in 2002, and the Republicans were, were implementing strategies based on this insight. Now, a decade later, social scientists are just starting to catch up. Uh, in 2011, a study came out finding 
uh, a link between perception of scientific consensus and support for climate policy to mitigate climate, climate change. So basically they found that when people understood that the scientists agreed, they were more likely to support climate action. But if the people thought that those, the scientists were still arguing about the human caused global warming, then they were less likely to support climate action. Now this result was replicated in another study in 2013 and basically found the same result that perception of consensus predicted support for climate um, action. And they said that reducing the consensus gap, I didn't use that phrase, but, but um, that's basically what they're arguing. Reducing the consensus gap is crucial for increasing public support for emissions reduction policies. So social scientists are talking about this over the last few years, but more than a decade ago, um, opponents of climate action were already acting on this insight and implementing strategies to cast out on the consensus. And then, and then more than two decades ago, fossil fuel companies were doing the same thing. So in late 2011, I started talking to Jim Powell, who's a geologist. He wrote the book, The Inquisition of Climate Science. And we started talking about continuing Naomi Rezke's work. She um, did that survey or that analysis of, of the um, peer-reviewed climate panels. And we thought it's been, it's been nearly a decade since it came out. And uh, it would really be worth um, continuing that and, and really extending that analysis as much as we could. Her study was over 93 to 2003, so we decided to extend that to a 21 year period, which, which included about 3,000 papers. Now, being a glutton for punishment, we decided to add global warming papers to our, to our sample, and that got up to 12,000, over 12,000 uh, papers in that sample. Now, after we finished all this work, I found out that there were two other projects trying to do the same thing. And they both had about a thousand papers in their sample, and both projects never finished. And if I'd known that, I probably wouldn't have been quite so ambitious in doing so many uh, papers. But, um, but somehow we managed to, to get through it anyway. And we basically spent about a year reading the abstract of, of every one of these papers and categorizing the level of endorsement of human caused global warming in each abstract. Now what we did was work, we identified about 4,000 papers, just over 4,000, that stated the position on whether humans were causing global warming or not. Now among those 4,000 papers, we found a 97.1% agreement that humans were causing global warming. Now this, this graph here, the, the blue line is what I'm talking about. This, this was um, the percentage of abstracts stating the position on global warming that endorsed the consensus. Now, by abstract, I mean just that, that short paragraph that, that goes at the start of every peer-reviewed paper. They're not always short. Some of them were incredibly long, and, and I felt like writing a letter to the journal asking them to enforce word limits on their abstracts. But, and when we wrote our paper, we made it as short as we could, just out of consideration if anyone else had to do a similar analysis. Now, so that was, that was from us reading every abstract and, and, and raking the level of endorsement of, as stated in, in the text. We also decided to email the scientists who wrote the papers and ask them to rate their own papers. So we sent out about 8,000 emails. They were, they were all the emails that we could track down. Um, I think it was about 29,000 scientists in total writing these 12,000 papers. So we found about, what's that? about a third of a third of them will obtain an email address. And 1,200 scientists responded. So we got 1,200 scientists um, rating their own papers, um, leading to about 2,000 papers in total um, getting rated by the actual authors of the paper. And this green line is the result. So, so again, um, what we found was, was an overwhelming consensus among papers stating the position on human-caused global warming, and the average over the whole period was 97.2%. So strikingly uh, consistent with our 97.1% that we got from our abstract writers. 
So when our paper was published, we were well aware that reading a scholarly peer review paper is not really everyone's cup of tea, and we wanted to make the science as accessible to the public as possible. So when the paper came out, we also uh, released a website which explained the science, the results of our research, in as simple and as visual way as, as possible. And yeah, so, so the website, the paper will come out together and give you issue a press release. And the result was that the following day, after the paper came out, I woke up to find out that um, the president of our Twitter account had tweeted about our research. Now they say that everyone gets their 15 minutes of fame, but this happened at about 4 a.m. Brisbane time. So by the time I woke up, my 15 minutes had already been over. <laughs> now, um, our, our goal, um, or one of our hopes with the research, was to really close that consensus gap, to reduce that misperception and that, that people think that only 55% of climate scientists agree. And, and this was a good step in that direction, of, of, actually a step that exceeded our expectations. Now, about a week or so after, after the paper came out, Obama gave a, a rather landmark historic <coughs> speech about climate change and about the actions that America should be taking to mitigate climate change. And, and one thing you can say about the guy is he does know how to communicate. He uh, scheduled the speech on a, on a hot summer day out in the sun. While he was giving the speech, he started taking off his jacket as the, as the sun beat down. He was constantly mopping his brow <laughs> throughout the speech and rolling his sleeve up as he, as he kept going. If the speech had gone on much longer, we might have found out whether he was a boxers or brief president. <laughs> and he also said this, that 97% of scientists, including, oh, I won't read it all, you get, you get the gist, right? But the, the important thing was, was reaffirming that, that there's overwhelming agreement among the scientific community. And so, exceeding our hope that we could could not raise awareness of, of the 97% consensus. So one result of all the hoo-ha was, was over the, the uh, several weeks, there was extensive uh, media coverage of the research, um, a lot of it in non-English countries, and we really did hope to get the, the research out beyond the, the echo chamber, beyond just those that community of people who are already engaged with the climate issue. And getting, getting it into mainstream media was really a big part of achieving that. So, some other measures of impact of, of the research was, and I didn't even know about this, but there's a website, Altmetric, all the academics probably are, are aware of it already. But this, this is a measure of online buzz about scholarly articles. And what they, um, what they measured was that our paper was in the top 1% of scholarly papers published at the same time as our paper, and also that it was in the top 5% of all scholarly papers. Although you probably have to take that figure with a bit of a grain of salt. I think when John Tyndall discovered greenhouse gases in 1850, there probably wasn't someone with a smartphone tweeting, OMG, Tyndall just discovered GHGs. <laughs> so, um, so probably just the last decade or so of, um, of research. Also, in the, in the four months since the papers come out, um, it's already been cited in a number of other scholarly papers. And what interests me about this was them being cited in a, in a range of different types of journals, but not just climate journals, but, but uh, bioscience and, and historical journals. So I think that's a measure of the broadness of the relevance of this research. It's also attracted interest from another group of um, people who are probably not quite as friendly towards the research results as others. And this is a summary of some of the headlines and, and types of criticisms and attacks against our research. And it's really come in a, a multitude of forms. There's been blog posts, cartoons, YouTube movies, a report, a paper. So um, over the 120 days since the, the paper's come out, has been over 170 attacks on the research posted online, which probably makes it maybe the most attacked paper, science paper of this year, until next Friday when the IPCC report comes out. <laughs> now, usually 
getting your research getting attacked that much, um, it's probably there's little upside to that. But in my case, if you're doing a, a PhD in the psychology of consensus denial, it actually provides a lot of data. In fact, as a social scientist, it's really like a, an all-you-can-eat buffet. <laughs> but, uh, now, there's a, there was a study that came out in 2009 that looked at a number of different movements that deny our scientific consensus. So, for example, denying the link between smoking and lung cancer, denying um, evolution, denying the link between human activities and climate change. And what they found was all these different movements had five characteristics in common. And their fake debate, which is portraying, uh, trying to portray the impression that there's still an ongoing scientific debate about this consensus position. It's about using logical fallacies and, and raising the level of scientific proof required to impossible standards. Uh, cherry picking the data and conspiracy theories. And if you ever have to deal with science misinformation, it's good to, to be aware of these five um, characteristics because it enables you to detect the, um, the type of strategies and the type of techniques used to distort the science. So the way I remember them is just the acronym FLIP if you, um, if you ever need to uh, cast around in your head for one of the five characteristics. Now, the funny thing is, in many of the attacks directed against our research, uh, these five characteristics appear in, in the criticism of our paper. And so, so there's quite, there's actually quite an instructive um, experience looking at some of, the, some of the criticisms in more detail. So I'll, I'll go through five examples, one for each characteristic. Can we go for time? By the way, can we do the first is fake debate. And this is about manufacturing the appearance that there's still, scientists are still debating um, fundamental facts. And there's really two ways that you can manufacture this appearance of fake debate. Now, one way is you have, you have an overwhelming consensus in the scientific community, but you want to portray to the public that there's a 50 50 debate on what we can use is fake experts. And we see this all the time in the climate change debate. We see surveys posted online featuring tens or hundreds or even tens of thousands of scientists dissenting from the consensus position. But almost all the names on these surveys are not, don't have any actual expertise in climate change. Now, the second way to promote fake debate is by magnifying the minority. So that's taking just those, that 3% and magnifying their significance so that in the public eye, all they see is, is this guy arguing for, this guy arguing against, there must be a 50-50 debate. And, and this strategy is, is a big contributor, aided and abetted by, by the media to some degree, on why the public think that there's a 50-50 debate among the climate science community. Now this strategy was actually used against our paper as well, and, and they, um, one of the first blog posts criticising our paper found seven scientists who, who uh, disagreed with how we rated their papers. Now these seven scientists, or most of them, happened to be uh, quite uh, well-known climate deniers, scientists who, who denied the consensus. And he, he used these examples of the seven people to, um, to cast out on the results of our paper. But the thing was, we, we didn't just ask seven scientists to compare or to, to rate their own papers. We asked, we got 1,200 scientists to rate their papers. And so what, what this blog post was doing was just magnifying the significance of these seven people, che cherry picked seven people who, who already um, disagreed with the consensus compared to the full body of evidence or the full community of scientists. And when when you asked or when we asked all the twelve hundred scientists to write their own papers, the result was almost exactly the same as what we obtained when we rated the abstract text. The second characteristic of consensus denial is logical fallacies. Now I just want to concentrate on one in particular, which is the straw man. And that's 
when you misrepresent the position of of, or, of the of your opponent or misrepresent the position of the science, uh, so that it's easier to attack, so it's easier to debunk. And a, a straw man that was labelled in our research was well, maybe I will read this one. The philosophy of science allows no role for head counts. To Aristotle's sophistical reputation. No, no, I can't. I can't be wrong. This is this is written by Monkton. It's hard enough reading it. I don't mind saying that. But um, but the gist of the argument was that that we were we were um using a popularity argument. We were using a a head count to determine what scientific truth is. Now, this is a position that we never actually argued. We never argued in the paper. And on the contrary, when our paper came out, we actually argued the opposite. We uh, published the uh, Frequently Asked Questions page on our website on the same day that our paper came out. And we addressed this very question. Isn't science decided by evidence? And our answer was absolutely. And then we use that quote by John Reisman, which I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, and discussed how scientific consensus doesn't prove human caused global warming. Our understanding of the science is based on the evidence. But when we have that consensus of evidence, the result is a consensus among the scientific community. So, so it's kind of ironic that, um, that uh, Mark then is accusing us of a logical fallacy when he's actually committing the fallacy of the straw man. Now the third characteristic of consensus denial is impossible expectations, which is basically demanding a level of proof that is so high that you can't possibly um, achieve consensus. Now, the tobacco industry perfected this tactic in the 1970s, um, constantly demanding higher levels of proof that smoking caused um, lung cancer. And the purpose of this was just to delay uh, regulations of, of, of the tobacco industry or regulations of smoking use. And, and so, so impossible expectations is one of their, um, their favorite strategies. Now, I'm going to have to go to Moncton again. I'm sorry that I, but he, he provides such great quotes that it's hard. I did look for someone else to use the same argument, but none of them were as, as, as succinct as him. Now, he, he argued at one point that rather than 97% consensus in the literature, there's actually a 0.3% consensus in the literature. Now, that's quite a turnaround, don't you think, from 97 down to 0.3. And the way he achieves that is through the, the, the technique of impossible expectations. Now, the way he defined endorsing the consensus was it was only, they had a, a paper only endorsed the consensus if in their abstract they stated that humans were causing at least half of global warming. So they had to quantify the level of human cause of global warming. Now this means that some of these statements from other abstracts, as, as far as Munkin is concerned, they didn't endorse the consensus. So when a paper says that global warming, um, is a result of human activities. In Moncton world, that doesn't endorse the consensus. When he says that um, when they talk about dangerous and anthropogenic interference with the climate system, because it didn't quantify it as more than half, he didn't consider that as an endorsement of human caused global warming. And, and again, talking about an anthropogenic fingerprint on the global climate change, which is one of my favorite uh, metaphors for we were talking about human caused global warming. Uh, again, because they, they didn't fit this specific definition um, of endorsement, he, he would have struck that from the record. And the result of that, of that definition is that 99% of the papers that endorse human caused global warming no longer endorse human, human uh, global warming in his books. And so when you remove all the endorsement papers, amazingly he found but there was no scientific consensus. Now the fourth characteristic of consensus model, and we're nearly, we're nearly at the finish now, is cherry picking. Um, so that involves ignoring, <coughs> ignoring the full body of evidence 
and just zeroing in on the, the bit of data that says says what you want it to say, but most importantly, ignoring the rest of the evidence. Now, now just about every attack on our paper use that to one degree or another, because um, a real crucial part of our research was was this green line asking the scientists to rate their own papers. Now, most of the um, critiques of our paper um, criticised how we rated them, accused us of bias, didn't like our methodology. But all that is swept aside by the fact that the scientists who are who know more about their research than, than anyone um, arrived at the same answer, and they too found a 97.2 percent consensus. So now I'm under the fifth. The fifth um, characteristic of consensus demand. Now, when you have an overwhelming agreement among climate scientists, but if you disagree with what they think, then inevitably you end up resorting to conspiracy theories. <laughs> it's, it's, it's really the alternative is that they all accidentally get the wrong answer in the same direction. Um, and conspiracy theories is a slightly more plausible. Uh, explanation. Although with our research we found over 10,000 scientists from over 80 countries endorsing the consensus. That's one hell of a conspiracy. Now, actually, I, I didn't, I didn't uh, mention it earlier, but there was a delicious conspiracy theory by James Downpole at the Telegraph in the UK. We, and we actually, before our paper came out, we did research on previous attacks on consensus papers. Uh, anticipating what would be likely attacks on ours. And, and by and large, we address those in our FAQ page and, and we anticipated most of them correctly. But there was one which we didn't anticipate at all, which was that our paper was funded by ExxonMobil and by Big Oil. We thought, what? So, um, that, that was, a, that was um, kind of our left field. But the, the, con the conspiracy theory out that I probably is my favourite was given on American television, and it was by Moncton again. And what he argued was that the journal, Environmental Research Letters, that published our paper, was he suggested that it was created just so that they could publish our paper, which is flattering in a way. But, um, but also, if you if you take that that theory to its to its ultimate, well, let's just explore it for a minute. Because um, let's have a look at the journal Environmental Research Letters. Now, this was um, created by the Institute of Physics, which has been around since 1920, and they publish over 70 peer reviewed journals. Uh, they're an extremely prestigious organization. They founded the, the, <coughs> the ERL journal in 2006, and they've published over 1,000 papers since then. And the journal actually has quite a high impact level. Um, the, the impact they have is equivalent to um, more established journals such as Climatic Research and Geophysical Research Letters. And I think part of the reason why this journal has had such a, such a good impact is uh, their papers get downloaded a lot. Uh, a lot of scientists access the research, um, partly because it's open access, partly because they're brought in innovations like video abstracts, which they say uh, doubled the amount of downloads that their, their research gets. So, if, if all this was created just for the purpose of um, publishing our paper um, seven years after the, um, they, they started their journal, all I can say is they covered their tracks pretty well. So, so just to finish up, um, there's two, really two key points about about this issue. And one is that for over two decades there's been a, consi a, a persistent uh, misinformation campaign seeking to manufacture doubt about the scientific consensus and closing the consensus gap or increasing public perception of, of the level of agreement among climate scientists is is removing an, uh, a significant roadblock that's preventing public support to to mitigate climate change. Um, and yeah, so if we've got time, I'll be happy to answer any questions as well.
Thanks very much. I think we have about 10 minutes. Okay, yes. The, of course, the issue is how you close it. The consensus gap between the public and the scientific community. And, you know, major cause for that is the bad news of the the media, like the fact that Australia is trying to go back to Europe with the influence of the fossil fuel industry. So now you've just got a government elected for this. So, I guess the question I have to use is your proposals for uh, how you see actually they're going to be reversed. Yeah, it's, it's not an easy question how do we close the consensus gap? Uh, and it's, I think it's actually among the community of climate communicators, uh, it's actually an ongoing question. There's a lot of quite vigorous discussion about what is, the, what is the best way to do it. And it's difficult because, as you say, um, media has an influence on, on perpetuating this gap, particularly conservative media. Um, but, but one of the biggest predictors of perception of consensus is the political ideology of, of, of just the individual. So the more conservative, I, when, I, when I did this survey asking how many um, climate scientists agree, what I found was, uh, at, at, I, I also measured their political ideology. And when you start at the left-wing side of the political spectrum, the perceived consensus was about 70%. When you went over to the conservative end of the spectrum, the perceived consensus was about 30%. So there's a big, big line as you get more conservative, the perceived consensus drops down quite sharply. So that is a, a really um, typical, not, maybe not insurmountable, but extremely problematic um, uh, issue for communicators. And, and what I found was presenting just consensus information actually had a backfire effect among those, but just that small minority of the conservative end. They actually became less accepting of human caused global warming in response to the news that all the climate scientists agreed, which sounds counterintuitive, but that's that's what happens when people receive evidence that they perceive threatens their ideology. So I'm raising a lot of problems but not giving you many answers, I'm afraid. Hopefully within the next year I can have some more answers for you. Yes. Well the question I have then is in the sky climate skeptic allowed to ask a question? Is a climate skeptic allowed to cherry pick without the climate scientist saying, oh, you're misinterpreting everything, there's, there's peer reviewed um, articles and the science agrees, and not everyone, the average Australian, does not necessarily have access to all the scientific journal articles, for example. Mm. And, well, I'm, I'm not a climate skeptic or anything like that, I'm just asking, you know, by us, so I'm doing the us them thing. That's, that's another one. But what else is there uh, than just saying, oh, there's consensus, there's scientific consensus, and how do we translate that to, to something that the average Australian can understand without um, scientists or, or interest groups running around saying climate change is real, we must step out and deal with it. There's um, consensus. I guess um, one thing that I think that the public don't understand is that, that science isn't a monolith. It's, it's not all. It's not all or nothing. We don't either understand everything, or we don't understand it all. There's, there's, there's like, I guess, it'd be better if I did this with slides and pictures. But, but imagine science as a, as a grey area where a lot of the science is still being investigated. There's a lot of elements of climate science that 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 still have ongoing questions. But then there's this kernel in the middle that that is uh, that have established. Um, I guess settled science that the scientists have resolved and have achieved consensus on. And so I think my guess is that when, when the public see scientists debating about any particular aspect of climate change, they translate that to the whole climate area is, is open for debate, um, as opposed to certain areas are open for debate, but certain areas have been settled in the peer reviewed literature. So, so making that distinction, I think, would be a good step in, in people understanding how science works and the structure of scientific knowledge. Yes. 
Um, what is your opinion on claims that the anticipated IPCC report reduces predicted, the predicted effect of greenhouse gases on global warming? And how do you think that will play into public perception of global warming? So there's an IPCC report coming out next Friday, probably. And um, it's probably one of the most leaked documents and commented documents um, in modern history because just about everyone has weighed in on, on what they think of it, even though it hasn't even been finished yet. And, and one of the um, one aspect that's gotten a lot of attention is climate sensitivity, which is how much will global temperature change in response to us adding more CO2 into the atmosphere. And in 2007, the the best estimate for climate sensitivity was three degrees but with a possible range of values of 2 to 4.5. Now, the new report is expected to say that the, the best estimate for climate sensitivity now is still 3 degrees. That hasn't changed. So, so our best estimate for how uh, global temperature will change in the future hasn't, hasn't changed appreciably from 2007. But what they have updated is the range of possible values. Uh, rather than 2 to 4.5, now it's, I think it's 1.5 to 4.5. So they have, have our lower, the lower bound. Um, and so basically it means it was a broader range of possible values. But to me, the, the, the take home from this is that the, the, our best estimate is still the same. And the, the, these, these um, values, either at the low end of the, the predicted range or at the high end, are very unlikely. Um, it's most likely it's going to be within that, that three degree range. Uh, probably another important point is even if it is at the 1.5 range, even if the most optimistic um, scenario takes place, if we continue business as usual, global warming will still take us into dangerous territory even at the most optimistic scenario. So, so that's no license for us to say, well, let's just continue um, business usual trajectory. How do you think the public will react, though, to those changes? in this Well, um, that's, that's a good question because over the last week there's been basically a misinformation blitz in the mainstream media. And I don't, I don't recall it happening like this in 2007, but I've never seen anything like the, just the level of, um, of articles. Uh, pretty much anyone who came up in our 3% our of dissenting scientists seems to have written an opinion piece in a Murdoch newspaper over the last week. And, and so they're really making a big deal about, about this fact. So how the public will react, I guess, really depends on how well scientists can communicate or put, put that misinformation into proper context. Yes? Um, you mentioned uh, the community of climate communicators. Um, I just wonder how much input is given to the design of the message as opposed to the content. Yes. Yeah. And well, in particular with that paper that it's quite set to look like mm. real paper. But more about the psychology of how to communicate that instance is visually. Yeah, I mean that's that's one of the key things that we're discussing. And after our paper came out, uh, a a climate communicator uh, got very cranky at me because he didn't like the design of how we were producing it. Like he said it needs to be done in this certain way, not the way you do. And, and really, that's an ongoing question. But, um, is, is there evidence to back up what he was? Um, he would say there is. Right. Uh, I would, I would argue, well, I argue that the, our approach was actually based on a lot of um, psychological research on, on recognizing a misperception and then what is the most effective way to, to um, reduce that misperception, to debunk the myth. And so, so we were drawing on, a, on 20 years of research into misinformation and debunking. And, and our, the actual press release that UQ released um, was, was structured in such a way that uh, taking into account the, um, the psychology of misinformation. So, but I, I see his point that, that it does need to be more research into, I mean, I mean the fact that when I presented consensus information to conservatives and it actually made them more skeptical of climate change. I think that's something that needs to be explored further, and it's it's really an ongoing area of research. So, yes. Right. 
So you're, you're mentioning whether the UN hired uh, communication firms to, to help them communicate the report. Um, yes, I think they have. They're, they're for, for an organization that has such uh, high level of significance in the public um, uh, debate about climate change, they haven't, in, they haven't invested much uh, money and effort in communication in the past, certainly not enough for, for the level of significance of their reports. And so I, I do understand that they are putting, at least putting a lot more effort into communication this time and, and also hopefully responding quickly when the report is, um, is being um, distorted, I guess. I think currently, whenever something's come out, they've basically issued a statement saying, hold your horses, we don't come out till um, next Friday, so just why don't we just wait till then. So I guess we'll really know after next Friday how, how much they've improved the communication. Um, right at the back there? Yeah, thanks. Um, you mentioned that you found in your, in your research a correlation between the way in which people are politically aligned and their understanding of the public consensus. Just wondering if you've seen any correlation between age um, or if that plays a factor in, in how much people understand the consensus on climate change. Um, that's a good question. Now, I have, I have uh, captured the age data, but I don't think I've looked at the correlation yet. But I am aware of other research that have looked at that. And they had a, a paper came out, which was actually, I like the title, I think it was um, Cool Dudes uh, talking about climate skeptics. And I think it was the conservative white male effect or something like that. And it looked at how um, people who were older, um, male, and, and conservative were more likely, significantly more likely to be skeptical about climate change. So yeah, I think, I think as age increased, um, so did climate skepticism. But what would be more interesting would be to see whether increasing age is, does it? How does that interact with our political ideology? Maybe as liberals get older, they become more accepting, and as conservatives get older, they become more rejecting. But in fact, I might go and have a look at that after this talk. So, thanks for the idea. So, yes. Um, I wonder about the benefit of naming and shaming the business book in particular identified the funding sources linked to the specific. Yeah. I think that there would be a lot of value in in journalists being aware, more aware of the qualifications of, of who they use as spokespeople on climate change. So that when they quote a spokesperson for a political think tank, that they, they make the reader aware of that. Otherwise, the, um, the reader will just see, he's an expert saying climate change is a problem, um, and must be a scientific expert, even if they're a lawyer for a conservative think tank. And, and this happens a lot. So, so how exactly that? I mean, that's that's a big ask that that, um, that, that journalists can uh, make this happen. But but I think resources like that might be of use. But another thing I think to be aware of is um, fossil fuels is only part of the picture. I think um, to like there is fossil fuel funding going into misinformation. But I think an even bigger um, part of the picture is is political ideology, in that it's the main driver of individuals, climate skepticism, and it's also, I think, the main driver in, in the misinformation campaign. It's driven by ideological uh, groups and by uh, the people on the, like all the whole climate blogosphere. By the, the, most of that will be people not getting funded by fossil fuel, but, but just um, driven by their, their ideology. Uh, do we have one more? So, okay, yes? Um, I just, I see right now the debate tends to be framed in terms of it's either the economy or the environment. And if you are going to 
support environmental solutions and it's going to cost more out of your pocketbook and you can't afford it, right? So that's the way it's been framed right now. And I just think the I've been married to the Chinese suggesting reframing, trying to reframe the way from the environmental issue to being a security issue. It's a long term threat to not our economic security, national security, security of our society, etc. as well as medical issues. So, have you looked a lot at how we reframe this discussion? Yes. Yeah, so it can then be understood and accepted by conservatives and that's, that's, that's a good question. There has been research into different frames. In fact, I was just a, in a, a lab meeting last night with the University of Western Australia who were looking at that exact thing, framing it in terms of economic terms versus environmental terms. And they referred to a paper by Myers, I think in 2011, that explored framing climate change as a national security issue, comparing to the environmental and, and health issue. And it was quite interesting, the result. What they found was, among conservatives, the national security framing actually had a backfire effect. It, it annoyed them that, that these scientists were trying to kind of hijack their language. You, hey, that's our thing. You know, you can't. You pin-headed uh, buffins, you can't. So, um, so I, think, I think it's... Um, it's a difficult thing. I think that, um, in fact, John Reisman, who's the, that guy I quoted at the start, he's actually a conservative who talks to conservative groups. And he's told me that conservatives can smell a liberal model. So, um, so trying to speak the language of, of, of a different cultural group from someone outside of that cultural group doesn't work at, at backfire. So, so it really requires messengers who share the cultural values of that group speaking in frames that, that are consonant with their worldview. I, I guess we're out of time, so um, yeah, thanks very much for everyone for coming and a few questions.